Okay, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for coming, particularly in this weather. And, um, and uh, I'd really like to thank you very specially for uh, being here today to commemorate, to celebrate the legacy of Tikna. Uh, I am really uh, happy to have had this visit from uh, Jose Manuel del Pino a few months ago asking me whether the observatory would be willing to participate in celebrating uh, the, uh, the, um, the bicentenary of, of uh, George Tickner. And I obviously immediately said yes. Uh, it, it'll be a real a great honor and very appropriate too, very relevant too, considering uh, this was uh, Tickner's alma mater. Uh, so I'm very glad, I'm very uh, um, uh, honored to have both Jose Manuel uh, Del Pino, who's Dartmouth professor of Spanish. So therefore, he comes from the university where Tickner first taught. And, uh, and yes, and uh, so where his career started, yeah. And uh, Jose Manuel, let me just introduce him very briefly, specializes in, in modern and contemporary literature and culture of Spain, particularly the avant-garde of the 19, 1920s and 30s, as, as well as his Hispanismo and the cultural intersections of Spain and the United States. And we are very fortunate to have Professor Rolena Adorno from Yale University, who's the first professor, or the first person actually, of a Spanish department to have received the MLA award for lifetime scholarly achievement. So first, congratulations for that. And a very thank you. Uh, great, um, thank you very much for being here. And uh, Professor Adorno specializes in, in, in colonial uh, literature, in literature and history and in 19th century origins of Hispanism and the, in the United States, and also in manuscript culture and textual transmission in colonial Spanish America. So I think we are very, very fortunate, very lucky to have both of them here today. And uh, I'd like to ask uh, whether anybody here doesn't speak Spanish, because they were wondering whether they could each present their own uh, their own papers in, in their native languages. Is, is there anybody here who can't understand Spanish? Is there everybody comfortable with Spanish too? So, because in that case, <laughs> because in that case, uh, Professor Del Pino will uh, present his, his, make his presentation in Spanish and Professor Adorno in English, which is also quite appropriate in this observatory, which is a bilingual center. So, they've got the floor now. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Marta, for the invitation. Thank you for the invitation, and thank you for coming. And uh, in a rainy, beautiful fall day in Cambridge, I'm very happy to be back eh, in the observatory. Bueno, como Marta Mateo ha dicho, voy a hacer la presentación en español. Eh, estaba pensando qué hacer eh, en est esta tarde. Eh, y creo que decidí hacer algo un poco para el no, el, el no especialista, porque no todo el mundo conoce el, la obra y el legado de George Tignor, así que voy a intentar, digamos, trazar una semblanza de cuál es eh, la figura de Tignor, su, su relevancia y si podemos hablar de su legado. Así que eh, vamos a ver qué tal queda la presentación con, los, eh, con, los, con el PowerPoint. <coughs> Bueno, George Tignor nació en Boston en 1791, en los ya independientes Estados Unidos de América. Su padre, Elisha Tignor, fue un hombre de cierta fortuna que estaba bastante bien conectado con los círculos más influyentes de la época. Elisha se crió en los bosques de New Hampshire, muy cerca del recién fundado Dartmouth College, en donde estudió. Esto le permitió tener una buena amistad con su primer presidente, Eliasa Willock un ministro eh, congregacionista de tendencias calvinistas y hombre fundamental en las primeras décadas de la institución. El lema de Dartmouth, ideado por su primer presidente, fue hasta hace no mucho el Vox Clamantis in deserto, 
lo que da una idea clara de su original espíritu evangélico. La institución se creó para educar a los hijos de los granjeros de la colonia, de los pequeños comerciantes y en lo posible se proponía cristianizar a los nativos abenaki. El joven Tignor fue un niño precocísimo, de gran inteligencia y educado con gran esmero por sus padres, hacía homeschooling y siempre tuvo los mejores tutores. Willock le enseñó y lo examinó con 10 años de los evangelios en griego y de, la, y de, y de Cicerón para poder entrar en, en Dartmouth, cosa que hizo con 14 años. Eh, con, como digo, con 14 años entra en Dartmouth como junior y se gradúa del college con 16 años. Rememorando su estancia en lo que era un poco más que una pequeña escuela media, confiesa que estudió poco, pero que, eh, y que además sobresalió mucho por el bajo nivel académico de sus compañeros, pero que disfrutó muchísimo por, en sus paseos por los bosques casi vírgenes de las márgenes del río Connecticut. Terminada su, digamos, eh, imperfecta educación en lenguas clásicas y en los conocimientos básicos de matemáticas y ciencias, regresa a Boston a estudiar Derecho, con lo cual complacía los designios de su padre. Yo le digo a mis estudiantes siempre que tienen que luchar entre su auténtica vocación y las presiones de los padres para que sean abogados, como le pasó a Tigno. Al concluir los estudios de leyes, ejerce unos pocos meses, pero sigue cultivando la que es su auténtica vocación, las lenguas y las literaturas clásicas y las belles lettres. Recibió clases privadas, una constante en su vida, de francés, del instructor de francés y de español en Harvard, el muy conocido en la época Francis Sales, que enseñaba precisamente en este campus, y de una figura muy importante en el Boston de la época, John Sylvester Gardiner, eh, rector de la, de la Iglesia Trinity en Boston, y eminente especialista en griego y latín. Aquí tenemos a Gardiner. Él fue eh, eh, uno de los fundadores del Anthology Club, miembro del Boston Athenaeum y lo introduce a los, en los círculos intelectuales eh, en los que con poco más de 20 años el joven Tignor brilla por méritos propios. Eh, se integra en la mejor sociedad unitaria de Boston a la que pertenecen hombres tan influyentes como el presidente de Harvard, John eh, Kirkland, pero eh, no cuaja su vocación su vocación eh, para las leyes. Así que eh, empieza a pensar que necesita una nueva orientación en su vida y realmente lo que a Tigno le gusta son las lenguas clásicas, el griego, el latín, el francés y el alemán. Además, él eh, se da cuenta de la pobreza de las bibliotecas que existe en esa época, en Harvard y en Boston, con lo cual le pide permiso a su padre para, eh, para hacer un plan de estudios en Europa. Antes de ello, decide viajar a Virginia en compañía de su amigo Francis Cali Gray para visitar al sabio de Monticello, el tercer presidente de los Estados Unidos, Thomas Jefferson. Además de su interés por conocer a uno de los hombres más, más cultos del país, quiere pedirles cartas de recomendación que le permitan entrar en los círculos influyentes de Londres, París, en Alemania. Y lleva como prueba de su valía una carta del segundo presidente de Estados Unidos, John Adams. Así que tiene cartas, va a tener cartas de los dos. Tras un terrible viaje, en pleno invierno, llega a la casa de Jefferson el sábado 4 de febrero de 1815. Apenas pasó tres días allí, pero en ese breve tiempo causó una enorme y favorable impresión a eh, Jefferson. Eh, la carta de John Adams a, Je a Jefferson dice así, Dear Sir, the most exalted of our young geniuses in Boston have an ambition to see Monticello, its library and its sage. Eh, esa es la carta de presentación que lleva, eh, que lleva eh, eh, Tignor a Monticello. Unos meses después, Jefferson le escribirá a John Adams, I thank you for making known to me Mr. Tignor and Mr. Gray. They are fine young men indeed. 
and if Massachusetts can raise a few more such, it is probable she, should be be she would be better counseled as to social rights and social duties. Mr. Tignor is particularly the best bibliograph I've met with, and very kindly and opportunely offered me the means of reprocuring part of the, li the literary pressures which I have ceded to Congress to replace the devastation of British vandalism at Washington. Así que con estas cartas de recomendación, Tignor está preparado para hacer su viaje europeo. La lectura de la obra de Madame de Stahl de la Alemania, sobre la Alemania, 1813, y otras figuras románticas de la época, lo había inclinado a estudiar en la Universidad de Göttingen, la más innovadora y abierta en ideas eh, de la época. Marcha, pues, a Europa con 24 años. Y tras unas semanas en Londres y un viaje por los Países Bajos, llega a Gotinga en agosto de 1815 con su amigo Edward Everett, futuro secretario de Estado, gobernador de Massachusetts y presidente de Harvard. En esta universidad alemana, Tignor es, un, es una curiosidad. Es un americano culto y de buenos modales que no responde a los estereotipos dominantes en Europa, sobre esos nuevos ciudadanos, un poco burdos, de la recién creada República de los Estados Unidos. No han visto nunca a un americano, o muy pocos, y cuando aparecen estos jóvenes, elegantes, cultos, que saben latín, que saben griego, se quedan bastante sorprendidos. El régimen de estudios al que se somete Tignor es rigurosísimo. Esto lo podemos, se lo digo yo a mis estudiantes y se quedan sorprendidos. Entre clases, tutorías y estudio individual, trabaja entre 14 y 16 horas diarias, con pequeños eh, reposos para comer, para practicar el esgrima y dormir unas cuantas horas. Como ejercicio para mejorar su nivel de alemán, traducirá el Werther de Goethe. Estudiará principalmente alemán, griego, historia y algo de ciencias. Toma clases con Friedrich Gutenberg en el centro de la imagen, eh, autor de la gran historia de la literatura europea de 12 volúmenes, cuyo tercer eh, volumen está dedicado a la literatura española. Estas clases se publicó en inglés en 1823, History of Spanish and Portuguese Literature. Estas clases y las notas muy precisas que toma de ellas tendrán un gran impacto en su visión posterior de la historia literaria, la aplicación a la literatura de las ideas de los filósofos Herder y Schiller y sus teorías sobre el espíritu de los pueblos, el famoso Vollgeist, así como la emergencia de las literaturas nacionales, será fundamental en sus trabajos. En una carta de noviembre de 1816 a su amigo Edward Channing afirma «La literatura alemana es una peculiar literatura nacional que salió directamente de la tierra y está tan íntima, íntimamente ligada a su carácter que es muy difícil que un extranjero la entienda. Esos mismos días, Tignor había recibido la invitación del presidente Kirkland de aceptar la recién creada Cátedra Abiel Smith en Lenguas Románicas y dirigir un programa de estudios en francés y español. Y Tignor, que era un hijo muy respetuoso, se pone en contacto con su padre y le pide permiso. Y además le dice que el sueldo que le ofrece no es suficiente para vivir, con lo cual el padre tiene que apoyarlo económicamente. Le envía dos cartas, una para que el padre decida qué carta envía, una para aceptando el puesto y otra eh, negando eh, la, la invitación. Así que el padre, un, un hombre muy sabio, que conoce la vocación de su hijo, le da permiso y acepta el puesto de profesor en Harvard. Pero Tignor no sabe español, un pequeño problema, o sabe muy poco, había tomado algunas clases con Francis Sales. Así que necesita aprender la lengua y decide, pide permiso a su padre, que tiene que mandarle fondos, para viajar por España. Antes de ello, hace un viaje por Europa, sobre todo por Italia, y va a ir conociendo una serie de personas muy importantes en la cultura de la época, desde Lafayette, Alexander von Humboldt, Madame de Stael, Auguste Schlegel y Chateaubriand. 
y con su amigo Everett también visitan a Goethe en 1816. Así que, por, do, por donde va, va dejando eh, un recuerdo extraordinario y va, en cierta manera, siendo de embajador de la nueva república. Algunos, eh, bueno, pues ya estamos en la frontera entre Francia y España, 1818. España está todavía devastada por las guerras napoleónicas. Algunos minutos después, a ver si sincronizo, bueno, aquí tenemos algunas de las notas que Tignor toma para futuros libros que va a comprar, son eh, notas manuscritas muy detalladas, y aquí tenemos el diario del primer día en su entrada en España, el 30 de abril de 1818. <coughs> Algunos minutos de pasar por el Col de Pertu, eh, escribe, tuve ante mí dos columnas caídas con sus capiteles rotos, que marcaban la separación de ambos reinos. Comprendí que estaba en España y experimenté un sentimiento tan profundo y triste como no había vivido desde que partí. Y sin embargo, dice inmediatamente después, los guardias de la aduana han sido los más amables de toda Europa. Así que... En Figueras, donde hay fiestas, se anima y declara que se siente mejor y que era agradable estar entre aquellas gentes. Y apreciarán esto relacionándolo con la política española contemporánea. Entra en Gerona, en donde observa los estragos del sitio y de la resistencia de la ciudad contra las tropas napoleónicas. Admira el patriotismo de sus gentes y dirá, escribirá, esta es la primera vez que he estado en un campo de batalla, genuino ejemplo del heroísmo español. No obstante, también observa lo siguiente. Gerona, además, me dio mi primer vislumbre de otro aspecto menos positivo del carácter español. Me refiero a su esclavitud religiosa. Sorprendido, afirma que por primera vez se dio cuenta de lleno de lo que suponía vivir en un país católico. De Barcelona y su carácter afirma, si su fanatismo por la religión es tremendo, su fanatismo por el placer es aún mayor. Se admira de la diversidad de bailes públicos y de la coquetería de las mujeres. Desde Barcelona a Madrid tardará 13 días en un viaje, cito, agotador, miserable y doloroso, en un coche sin muelles. Encuentra pueblos miserables en un país arrasado por la guerra. Sin embargo, del valor de los zaragozanos ante el odiado Napoleón dirá ¿Y cómo es posible que la naturaleza humana pueda eh, tener tal fuerza y resolución? Y aquí, acudo al, y aquí acude al tropo romántico de Volgais, del que, como sabemos, se ha imbuido en sus estudios de Alemania. Y dice... Rindo homenaje al espíritu del pueblo que defendió Zaragoza. Tignor conecta la historia presente con la pasada y establece un lazo entre Sagunto, Numancia, Gerona y Zaragoza. Declara, ese espíritu ha existido siempre en España y nunca en otro país. Y aún más exaltado continúa, rindo homenaje al carácter español y especialmente al aragonés. Confiaría mi cartera e incluso mi vida sin dudar a un aragonés de la clase más baja. Así que lo que encontramos y lo que encuentra él es un país depauperado eh, en esa alegoría de, los, de las columnas rotas, pero un país en donde a pesar del fanatismo religioso, no olvidemos que Tigno es un protestante a carta cabal, educado en los principios del unitari unitari unitarismo y un país trin trinitario como es España, le resulta muy eh, sorprendente. Y él encuentra y busca en España lo que él había ya descubierto en Alemania, que es esa idea del espíritu de los pueblos que emana directamente y metafóricamente del pueblo. Tignor además viaja con el Quijote como va de Mecum y va leyendo el paisaje a través de los ojos de Cervantes. En Madrid residirá entre mayo y septiembre. En su diario de viaje describe la ciudad, sus edificios, instituciones públicas, bibliotecas, academias, museos. Documenta fiestas, funciones de teatro y se admira y horroriza con los toros, a los que le dedica diez páginas a los toros. 
También frecuenta las tertulias y reuniones elegantes de la capital, como la de la duquesa de Osuna, a donde acude lo mejor de la sociedad madrileña más un selecto grupo de diplomáticos extranjeros. Durante su estancia recibe lecciones privadas de español y de literatura por parte del erudito José Antonio Conde. Tiene en suma una visión cercana del pueblo y de la aristocracia. También conoció al rey en, una, en unas sesiones de, eh, teatrales y afirma lo siguiente, el rey como persona es un vulgar desvergonzado. Y después de todo ello afirma, para su propia sorpresa, que el pueblo español, el pueblo bajo español, es el mejor material humano que ha encontrado en Europa. Hace pues ese paralelismo entre carácter popular y carácter nacional, que va a ser muy importante para entender después su apreciación por la Edad Media y por el, los, los, el romance. ¿no? Viaja naturalmente a Andalucía buscando la huella árabe. En Córdoba, admirado, eh, admira la mezquita y conoce a dos personas muy importantes del roman romanticismo español, al duque de Rivas y a su hermano pequeño, don Ángel, que después será el, el duque de Rivas. De allí marcha a Granada y eh, visita la Alhambra. La llegada de Tignor a Granada es muy interesante porque va a prestar sus respetos al arzobispo de Granada. Y el arzobispo, que era un hombre eh, culto, muy ortodoxo, se, se queda tan admirado con este joven americano que habla la lengua ¿no? decentemente, que le da las llaves del palacio arzobispal, le presta unas habitaciones y le pone un guía privado para que vaya a conocer la ciudad y para subir a la Alhambra. Una cosa muy interesante de la Alhambra es que es vista como ruina. Y dice Tignor, las ruinas que permanecen son valiosos monumentos de la gloria y esplendor que una vez los habitaron. Así que ante este monumento experimenta el deleite, la admiración, la melancolía que le lleva a la evocación del pasado. Estos es la, eh, son la, los grabados de la eh, primera edición de, de Alhambra de Washington Irving. Eh, es interesante porque eh, Tignor visita la Alhambra 10 años antes que Washington Irving, eh, con lo cual muchos de, las, eh, de, de lo que encontramos de esa emoción y de esa reflexión ante el pasado musulmán de España, veremos cómo se replica en la obra de Washington Irving. Después marcha a Málaga, ciudad comercial, y dice mal construida. Yo soy de Málaga y puedo, soy, puedo, dar, puedo dar fe de que por lo menos a final del siglo XX no se construyó demasiado bien. Parece que pasó igual en el siglo XIX. Gibraltar, Cádiz y Sevilla, con visita a la Biblioteca Colón, archivo de Indias. Sale de la ciudad hispalense y viaja hacia Lisboa con una partida de contrabandistas, porque preguntó cuál es la manera más segura de llegar hasta la frontera portuguesa y dijeron, pues, los contrabandistas, con ellos vas seguro. Y esos diez días que pasó por la alta sierra de Sevilla fueron para él, para él maravillosos. Dormían al raso y aprende, digamos, canciones populares, aprende, digamos, el lenguaje del pueblo. El futuro gran historiador de la literatura española salió del país el 15 de octubre de 1818, así que pasó cinco meses y medio, y, no, y nunca volvió a España. Se había hecho ya una idea de la nación, de sus gentes y de su literatura que permaneció inalterada durante el resto de su vida. ¿Qué observa en España, Tignor? ¿Qué le fascina y repele? Por un lado, el catolicismo, que como buen protestante le parece realmente difícil de digerir. En segundo lugar, encontramos ese enorme patriotismo que queda eh, todavía latente después de la guerra eh, con Napoleón. El pintoresquismo, España es el paraíso romántico por excelencia en el siglo XIX. El atraso en comunicaciones y en organización social. Un presente precario. Unas minorías educadas. Un pueblo bajo, recio e inmutable, donde reposan las virtudes de la raza. Y después esa conexión entre <coughs> carácter nacional y literatura nacional. Exactamente lo mismo que él ya había aprendido en Alemania. 
eh, en Harvard, eh, con sus juicios y prejuicios y dejando atrás un nutrido grupo de amigos, Tignor deja España y marcha a Inglaterra, en donde pasa unos días muy provechosos precisamente con Washington Irving. Visita sus bibliotecas, que era su pasión, viaja a Escocia, pasa unos días con Walter Scott, y para junio de 1819 está en Boston para incorporarse a su, flaman, a su flamante y mal pagada Cátedra Smith de Lenguas Romances. Tignor se casa en 1821 con la hija menor del rico banquero y comerciante Samuel Elliot, la cultivada Ana, y se establece como uno de los más ilustres representantes de la casta Bramín de Boston, ejerciendo durante el resto de su vida un papel de liderazgo intelectual extraordinario. Ejemplo de su estatus es el retrato hecho por el pintor Thomas Sully, Marisa lo conocerá muy bien ese retrato, <risa> He pintado en 1831, y Thomas Sully retrató a presidentes como Jefferson, Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams, al marqués de Lafayette y a personas más influyentes de la época. Y este es el póster del congreso que organicé la semana pasada en Dartmouth. Eh, son dos partes. Este, este otoño eh, trabajamos su figura como eh, profesor y educador y en la primavera tra trabajaremos más la figura de Tignor como historiador de la literatura y su legado hasta nuestra época. En Harvard, Tignor tiene que crear el programa de estudios de francés y español prácticamente desde cero, con sus apuntes y notas tomadas en la Universidad de Göttingen y tras el estudio intenso de los libros que ha consultado en las bibliotecas europeas sobre literatura española, más los ejemplares que ha comprado para él y para Jefferson, elabora el primer programa o sílabus de un curso de literatura española en Estados Unidos. Y este es el, esta es la publicación de su programa de estudios de 1823, que se titula Syllabus of a Course of Lectures on the History and Criticism of Spanish Literature. Este es eh, el prólogo y aquí él va pasando por las diferentes épocas. ¿Cómo funciona este sílabus? Son, él se organiza, organiza 34 conferencias de una hora por clase. Lo tiene completamente, digamos, estructurado. El sistema de educación en la época es, es el, el recitation. Los estudiantes tienen que sentarse o ir al profesor y aprender de memoria los textos que se les asigna. Y el profesor los irá llamando y tendrán que recitar de memoria la, eh, el trabajo que, ha, eh, que hayan preparado. Eh, Tignor dirá lo siguiente, son las primeras líneas del sílabo. The lectures on the history and criticism of Spanish literature for which the present syllabus has been prepared are about 34 in number each an hour in length and therefore amount to two octavo volumes. They are prepared for private classes in Harvard College and delivered three or more in each week, so long as the course continue, continues. The subject to which they are devoted is in many respects new in Europe and in this country is quite untouched. The Spaniards themselves have no work of history or criticism embracing the whole of their literature or even its best portions. And in England and in Italy, nothing has been done to assist them. Las obras en las que Tignor se basará son eh, sobre historia de la literatura en español y en portugués en menor medida son las historias de, de Butterbeck y de Sismondi. Eh, este, es el, este es el ejemplar que está en la biblioteca Rauner de, de, de Dartmouth y como veis está marcado por, no sé si es un estudiante o un profesor que se llama Colby en 1831 y está eh, el, el, el ejemplar lleno de comentarios. Pero por ejemplo, fijémonos eh, su entrada sobre Cervantes. Eh, Miguel de Cervantes, Two Lives of Him Are Important, One Prefix eh, to Academy's Edition of Don Quijote, and written by Vicente de los Ríos. Entonces, él va en cada obra haciendo una descripción corta y después, y esto es muy novedoso en la época, buscando, digamos, las referencias bibliográficas sobre las que él basa su estudio. Una cosa eh, fascinante de Tignor es que los libros son suyos. <risa> es decir, la colección de libros que, el, eh, que le sirven para estudiar la literatura española son volúmenes que él ha ido comprando 
hay que decir, sobre todo por la fortuna de su mujer y un poquito menos con la suya. Pero él ha amasado una eh, biblioteca ya a principios de la década de los 20 bastante impresionante que le sirve para avanzar sus estudios de la lengua. Eh, bien, Tigno no solamente aspira a renovar los estudios de las lenguas modernas o vivas, como él las llama, sino la propia organización y estructura de la universidad. No voy a meterme en ello, pero en la década de 1820 hay una auténtica revuelta en Harvard. Eh, los estudiantes se rebelan contra la institución y dentro de la institución hay asimismo unas guerras culturales, podríamos llamarlas, eh, tremendas, que terminarán eh, forzando la dimisión del presidente Kirkland en 1828 y en la década siguiente el propio Tignor, cansado, eh, se, se marcha. Tignor quería, eh, por ejemplo, crear eh, un, eh, unidades académicas, quería crear departamentos, algo que no existía en ese momento, y eh, la presión que ejercía era tan grande que al final cedió el presidente y el Board of Overseers, pero con la condición de que hiciera las reformas en su departamento y que no les diera la lata, en cierta manera, al resto de la universidad. Había mucha resistencia. Además, él venía con métodos europeos, quería hacer un Harvard a la, a la alemana, eh, siguiendo el modelo de Göttingen, y la universidad no estaba preparada ni eh, institucionalmente, ni los estudiantes tenían nivel suficiente para ese tipo de estudios. El estudiante de, de Harvard o de Yale o los estudiantes de las universidades de la época, hijos de comerciantes que van a las universidades para prepararse para la vida profesional, no completamente distinto lo que, de lo que encontramos ahora, pero ahora tenemos más, ahora tenemos más variedad. Bueno, veamos el segundo profesor Smith, eh, Henry Longfellow, el tercero James Russell. Eh, esto es lo que dirá, no quiero, eh, Russell, que, eh, the force of the new impulse did not last long, it was premature, eh, la, esa reforma. The students were really schoolboys, and the college was not yet capable of the larger university life. The conditions of American life, too, were such that young men look, looked upon scholarship neither as an end nor as a means, but simply as an accomplishment. Y Longfellow dejó escrito en su diario sobre la misma cuestión. Is this having your mind constantly a playmate for boys, constantly adapting itself to them, instead of stretch, stretching out and grappling with men's mind? Tignor, eh, debido a su posición social, eh, consiguió que le permitieran no vivir en el campus y vivía en, en el Hill, en el Boston Common. Porque los profesores de Harvard y tenían que también ser eh, cuidadores de los estudiantes y vigilar el campus que está aquí al lado por la noche. Y es eh, muy curioso porque iban por la noche paseando por el campus con una gran capa y debajo de la capa llevaban un farol. Así que cuando oían el lío que estaban montando los estudiantes, abrían la capa, sacaban el farol e identificaban al malhechor al que después podían castigar. Bueno, era una mezcla de internado y de, de escuela eh, casi preparatoria. Eh, este, eh, entonces, los, eh, Tignor publicará eh, precisamente sobre, eh, sobre esta cuestión unos remarks on changes lately proposed or adopted in Harvard University que no tuvieron el éxito que él pensaba. Además de su concentración en los estudios filológicos y la historiografía literaria y su afición bibliófila, Tignor siempre mantuvo un gran interés en los aspectos pedagógicos de la profesión. Fruto de ello fue la conferencia Lecture on the Best Methods of Teaching the Living Languages, delivered before the American Institute in 1832 y publicada en 1933. Muy interesante. Es una charla que él da con, eh, al presidente de Harvard y una serie de caballeros y de damas de, eh, de la sociedad. Eh, en ella, en esta conferencia de una manera pionera, Tignor propone el aprendizaje de la lengua como lengua hablada. The most important characteristic of a living language, the attribute in which resides its essential power and value, is that it is a spoken one. That is, 
that it serves for that constant and principled bond of union between the different individuals of a whole nation. Hay que decir que sus teorías sobre la enseñanza de la lengua causaban mucho malestar entre los profesores de griego y de latín, porque obviamente eh, tenían miedo de perder a los estudiantes y porque el griego y el latín se, se enseñaban, digamos, desde la gramática hacia arriba cuando Tignor quería empezar por la lengua hablada y después bajar a la gramática. Eh, y hay que decir que no tuvo del todo éxito. El principal eh, entonces propósito de aprender la lengua no será el utilitario, según Tignor, sino un do, uno más profundo y afectivo, el de facilitar la relación interpersonal. Um, the easiest and best method, therefore, for persons of all ages and all classes to learn a living language is undoubtedly to learn it as a spoken one. Bueno, el, algo también muy interesante encontramos. Eh, en, su, en, su, en su charla y es la idea de cómo unir la lengua hablada con los textos escritos y es, creo que es muy interesante esa cita For who can pretend to understand or estimate the untold riches of the elder drama of Spain or of its early romantic and popular ballads Or who will venture to open Don Quixote, who knows nothing of the peculiarities of the Spanish as a spoken language? Pregunta retórica. Así que Tignor eh, se anticipa casi un siglo y medio eh, al método comunicativo. Y también exp ex expone esta idea del componente esencial basada en la expresión de los deseos. Cuando preguntamos a nuestros estudiantes... ¿Cuáles son los motivos? Lo pregunté la semana pasada para aprender español. Entre motivos utilitarios también está esa frase que siempre dicen because I want, quiero comunicar, because I want to communicate. Esa idea de comunicar en una lengua que no es la propia es un motor fundamental en, en, ese, en ese gesto de salir de tu cultura y abrazar eh, otra cultura. Así que junto al componente oral está el estudio de la obra de los grandes maestros de cada nación. Así que en este escrito se encuentran las bases de métodos bastante modernos de la enseñanza de la lengua. <coughs> Nay, which is communicated by the very tones of the voice and the expression of the countenance with a vivacity and effect never found or felt by the most eager lover of acquisition in a cold and silent page. Hay que leer, eh, hay que aprender la lengua hablada y hay que darle a los textos clásicos una vivacidad que no tiene eh, la página escrita sola. Pero en 1935, poco después de esta charla, harto de luchar con una estructura académica reacia a sus propuestas innovadoras, que chocaban tanto con profesores como con estudiantes y administradores, y conmocionado por la muerte temprana de su hijo más pequeño, Dimite de la cátedra Smith y se la cede a un joven profesor y poeta, Henry Longfellow, que como él también había hecho el viaje europeo en 1829. Fruto de este periplo de Longfellow a Europa fue el famoso libro de viajes Outremer, A Pilgrimage Beyond the Sea, publicado como panfleto en 1830 y en forma de libro en 1835 en donde a la descripción de las bellezas de una tierra de romance y la vivacidad, vivacidad de sus atrasados habitantes, se le añaden sus notables conocimientos de literatura española. Es una guía de literatura española. ¿no? Longfellow tradujo las coplas de Manrique al inglés. Leemos en, eh, en estas páginas. My recollections of Spain are of the most lively and delightful kind. The character of the soil and in its inhabitants, the prodigal luxuriance and gay voluptuousness uh, of the south, a soft uh, and yet majestic language that fall like martial music on the ear, a literature rich in the attractive lore of poetry and fiction. These, but not these alone, are my reminiscences of Spain. As I write these words, a sh shade of sadness steals over me. My mind instinctively reversed from the degradation of the present to the glory of the past. 
or looking forward with strong, strong misgivings, but with yet stronger hopes, interrogates the future. Tignor, su esposa Ana y el resto de la familia se marchan a Europa en donde son recibidos por lo mejor de la sociedad de cada país que visitan como representantes de una nueva aristocracia, no la del dinero, perdón, no la del linaje, pero sí la del dinero y la cultura. No irán a España, pero Tignor seguirá aumentando su colección de libros españoles y portugueses gracias a libreros especializados y a su relación con el erudito y diplomático don Pascual Gallangos, a quien visita en Londres. Una vez de regreso y ya sin las cargas académicas, Tignor se dedicará a la escritura de su magna obra, que es una expansión del sílabus, pero ahora en tres volúmenes. Esta es la portada de la obra en la edición de 1849, publicada en Boston y en Londres. Eh, y este es, el esta es el programa del volumen primero y este es el programa del último volumen. Así que empezamos con eh, la introducción Origins of Modern Literature y terminamos con el periodo de Fernando VII. Voy un poquito rápido. Eh, sobre la obra de Tignor, el, eh, la introducción de Antonio Martín Espeleta, que ha trabajado sobre, los, sobre sus diarios y los ha traducido, señala una serie de, de cuestiones importantes. La idea del canon que Tignor va a crear en, en esa obra a mediados del siglo XIX y eh, ese momento de ese giro de crear una historia de la literatura nacional que refleje el carácter nacional. La idea, de nuevo, del Fall Guys es, el, es el, 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 digamos, el germen ideológico que anima toda la obra. Así podemos leer. In the first division of the first period, we are to consider the, the origin and character of that literature which sprang as it were from the very soil of Spain and was almost entirely untouched by foreign influence. Esta es la traducción que se hizo la, de la historia en 1856 por Pascual de Gallangos, que había sido su informante y quien le mandaba los libros desde Londres y después desde Madrid. Aquí encontramos eh, algunas de las, una cita muy eh, interesante que me van a permitir leer eh, brevemente. Tignor está, <coughs> o parafrasear, para ir rápido, Tignor, Tignor considera que la literatura española ha alcanzado una, un nivel muy alto, pero que en el momento contemporáneo, en el momento, eh, está en una gran degeneración. Y, eh, digamos, la receta que él da está recuperar ese sentido de lealtad y abandonar, digamos, el prejuicio religioso. Sin ello, dirá, eh, es una literatura condenada al fracaso. Me salto esta idea... Pero sí quiero hablar de eh, la idea de muros vacilantes del Alcázar de sus antiguas instituciones. Me gustaría conectar esta, este final de la historia de Tignor con, esta, con la pintura de Thomas Cole, The Course of Empire, porque funciona como una especie de alegoría de la, de la, alegoría de la construcción de una literatura nacional y en los intelectuales americanos de la época en su tradición republicana, tienen un gran miedo a repetir la historia de los imperios eh, del pasado, Roma, España, incluso el imperio napoleónico. Y aquí tenemos la evolución desde un mo momento arcádico, el momento, digamos, más eh, de gloria, y después la destrucción y la ruina. Y conecta muy bien con la, eh, con la cita eh, que veíamos de Tignor en su entrada a España. Uh, y, bueno, no quiero quitarle a Rolena mucho tiempo. Legado de Tignor eh, en la Biblioteca Pública de Boston. Si han ido a la sala de lectura, encontramos el busto de Tignor en la sala general. Y al entrar, esto es una foto tomada de una losa en el suelo. Aparecen los, eh, la clase, los patricios que fundan la, la institución. Su mejor discípulo y amigo fue William Hicklin Prescott, el famoso historiador, el, el, el historiador americano más importante probablemente del siglo XIX, 
que eh, y gran hispanista, tenemos ahí su historia del reinado de Ferdinand e Isabela, la conquista de México, después la conquista del Perú, eh, y su muerte prematura causó tanta tristeza en Tignor que dedicó eh, más de un año a escribir una biografía sobre Prescott, que es una de las obras de la vida final. Aquí tenemos una carta de José Amador de los Ríos a Jorge Tignor para tener un poco idea de cuál es el prestigio que alcanza Tignor en los círculos literarios y Amador de los Ríos cuando publica su historia y crítica de la literatura española le escribe eh, como maestro y a la vez que le dice que está usando su literatura, tam, eh, su obra literaria también le dice que no está de acuerdo siempre con él, es una carta de igual a igual. Estas son eh, algunas de las personas más influidas por Tignor, Gallangos, una relación de tú a tú, eh, José Amador de los Ríos y después Fitzmaurice Kelly, que también escribirá una historia de la literatura española al final del XIX. La casa de Tignor, aquí en la esquina de Beacon y de, y de Park, un retrato de su hija, Ana, que fue la albacea de su de su biblioteca y ella una, una de las figuras más importantes para la educación de la mujer en Boston y el estado actual de la esquina de Beacon y Park, ahora hay un restaurante francés muy chic <risa> y eh, tenemos aquí eh, también la proyección de la historia de la literatura española en historias posteriores como la historia de la literatura eh, de Hispanoamérica por otro estudiante de Harvard eh, Alfred Coester, que trabajó con compañeros de Jeremiah Ford, que fue el cuarto eh, Smith eh, profesor. Eh, esto lo estudió muy bien eh, Luis Fernández y Fuentes en la primera publicación del observatorio, titulada Lengua y literatura en los Estados Unidos, tres momentos estelares. Eh, algunos de los trabajos que han, mm, eh, que han mm, estudiado mejor la obra de Tignor, Tiak, Spain in America, de Richard Kagan, con un artículo magnífico de Rolena sobre Washington Irving. Y, ese, y otro trabajo extraordinario de Ven conmigo a la España leja, lejana, de Iván Haksik. Gracias. And I'm especially pleased to have just had the marvelous, he calls it introduction, <laughs> to George Tickner. And um, let me see if I can do the uh, trick of, uh, let's see, it's over here. I'm in the big windmill. Yes. Uh, where do I go? Yeah. Desde el principio, sí, perfecto. Ok, thank you very, very much. You will hear a few things that you've heard, but I hope that they will be sufficiently uh, non-boring so that you really assimilate just a couple of things that will be repeated here. I'm going to speak in English, as is already apparent. Mary? <laughs> well, <laughs> now I'm really... Yes, yes, here is Marisa Navarro, and, and here is Mary Gaylord. And so maybe I must absolutely uh, recognize both of you, and I'm thinking of you both as I say this. Okay. So I am uh, delighted to be here, and if I get it, yes, here we go. Tickner, as you already have heard, had the great good fortune to be introduced to the former third president of the United States by the second. John Adams knew both the young Tickner and his old colleague, his former vice president, sometime enemy, and enduring friend, Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson was close to being 50 years of age when Tickner was born, and Tickner lived nearly as long a life as Jefferson did, one deceased in 1826 and one in 1871, octogenarians, both of them. Tickner, like Jefferson, became a collector and a reader of books. That's what brought them together in the first place. 
Both are known for their remarkable historic libraries assembled by each, and both developed a deep interest in the worlds of Spain. Jefferson in its history, especially in the Americas, Tickner in its literature, especially that of Spain. They shared a deep respect for the learning of Europe, but with an eye to taking the best of its approaches and instituting them in this country. Their enduring friendship emerged on the field of higher education. One to practice it, the other to make its practice possible. From mentor and mentee, they became, in Jefferson's words, fellow laborers in the same field, where the harvest is great and the laborers few. It's the story of the development of this relationship that I want to tell this evening. And there will be blank slides. This is on purpose, just so you know. It's a pedagogical trick. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. I cannot live without books. This most famous quotation of Thomas Jefferson can be found in many places, not least the gift shop of the Library of Congress where it is emblazoned on baseball caps and on t-shirts of all sizes from petite to extra large. The sentence comes from Jefferson's uh, letter to John Adams written uh, in June of 1815, shortly after the wagons carrying the 6,700 books of Jefferson's personal library sold to the Congress for $23,950, that was $10 a folio volume, a buck for a duodecimo, had departed for Washington, D.C. It would be the cornerstone of the library the, of Congress's library, which had been decimated when the British burned the Capitol in 1814. And Jefferson continued, fewer books will suffice when amusement and not use is the only future object. As one of the great historians of Jefferson's library, Douglas L. Wilson observed, Jefferson had already taken at that point steps to acquire a good many replacements for the books that he had sold. And Adams rendered a most invaluable assistance by introducing him to the young George Tickner, that precocious graduate of Dartmouth who was on his way to Europe. And how much impressed Jefferson was by Tickner, you've already had a glimpse from Jose. In any case, it was the beginning of a remarkable relationship of two bookmen, and the story has actually been best told by Ori William Long in his monograph, Thomas Jefferson and George Tickner, a chapter in American scholarship, which I have uh, consulted uh, quite frequently for this talk that was published in 1933. Much more recently at the Tickner Society, Jeremy Dibble uh, did a, uh, a talk as trick, uh, uh, regarding Tickner's visit to Monticello. It's a private publication, as was Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia in its first uh, appearance. In any case, Long had scoured the Jefferson papers at the Library of Congress, the Coolidge collection of the Massachusetts Historical Society, the Tickner papers at Harvard, and to great advantage, the manuscript materials in the possession of Tickner's grandchildren, Rose Dexter and Phillips, Philip Dexter, who generously shared them with him. That was in the 1930s. In any case, when the relationship between these two bookmen shows us is that it was at least twofold in a very specific and telling way, it shows Jefferson's deep appreciation of the promise of youth for this country, knowledge and the next generation of its students being the guarantors of the nation's future. And Tickner reveals his enormous sensitivity and respect for the elder statesman. I'd say that the qualities that made the young Tickner an outstanding student would be the same virtues that later made him an outstanding teacher, learning and teaching were somehow the twin passions, avocation in Jefferson, vocation in Tickner, of the both of them. Tickner graduated from Dartmouth, is that right, Jose, at the age of 16. And when John Adams recommended him to Jefferson, as you have already heard, Jefferson received the young Mr. Tickner at Monticello in a grim and dreary, I'll just add that word, February in 1815. <laughs> Tickner was 24 years old and Jefferson, a very mature given the era and life expectancies, 72. 
Jefferson points this fact out to the young Tickner in the course of that initial visit. I should add that Tickner did see Jefferson's library at Monticello in February of 1815, just a few months before it went to Washington. But I'm going to show you it as, as it is assembled now. This is Jefferson's library in um, the Library of Congress, which has been a, a multi-decade work to reassemble it because it was dispersed and then uh, now regathered uh, in the early, since the early 2000s. It's in the Pavilion of the Discoverers in the Jefferson Building of the Library. In any case, Tickner remarked when he was there in February at Monticello of 1815 said, in so short a time he couldn't possibly estimate the library's value, even if he had been competent to do so, and he knew at that point he wasn't actually. Tickner characterizes Jefferson for his love of old books and young society. A love of old books and young society. And as I hinted a moment ago, these were the twin traits that drew Tickner and Jefferson together, developing and deepening their relationship over the decade of their acquaintance. Tickner offered to help Jefferson, as you already know, rebuild his library in Europe, including, and this he writes, this is Tickner writing to Jefferson. Any commands in relation to collecting a library or any other business which it may suit your convenience to entrust to me. I cannot suffer the opportunity to pass without repeating my acknowledgments for the advice and instruction I received from you in relation to my projected voyage and visit to Europe. And Jefferson was equally pleased writing to John Adams, and you've already heard this marvelous remark. He lauded the young Tickner, T Jefferson did, as the best bibliograph I have met with, explaining that he opportunely offered me the means of reprocuring some part of the literary treasures which I have ceded to Congress to replace the devastations of British vandalism in Washington. And Jefferson would use that phrase, the best bibliograph of my acquaintance, in writing a couple of years later to his Paris booksellers. And he urged them to consult Tickner and to consider his advice as absolutely my own choice and giving me the benefit of his knowledge so much more recent and extensive than mine. And that's the way Jefferson spelled knowledge. We know that that was not too standardized at that time. In any case, Jefferson then wrote to George's father, Elisha, equally enthusiastic. He sent him a, li a list of books which should be forwarded to George, and Jefferson lauded the young man's perfect knowledge of the best editions of the books which rendered his kindly offer too advantageous not to be accepted. And he added, I cannot pass over the occasion of congratulating you on the possession of such a son. His talents, his science, and excellent dispositions must be the comfort of his parents as they are the hope of his friends and country. And to those especially who are retiring from the world and its business, the virtues and talents of those who are coming after them are a subject of peculiar gratification. This is peculiar with the force of particular or special, not odd. And on July 4th, 1815, Jefferson writes to young Tickner himself, availing myself of the kind offer of your aid in replacing some of the library treasures which I furnished to Congress, I have made up a catalog which I now enclose. It is confined principally to the books of which the addition, the addition is important and sensibly to the value of the matter. This, as to notes, translations, and other accompaniments, chiefly respects the classics, but size and type respect all. I am attached to the octavo because not too heavy for the hand and yet large enough to open on the table according to convenience. Let's hear it for the octavo. <laughs> not too heavy for the hand and yet large enough to open on the table according to convenience. Jefferson entrusted to Tickner the choice of editions asking him to use his own judgment as to their selection with one proviso, only be so good as to remember my aversion to folios and cuartos <laughs> and that it 
overweighs a good deal of merit in the addition. The nerveless hand of a more than septuagenarian wields a folio or quarto with fatigue, and a fixed position to read it on a table is equally fatiguing, as so many of us already know. And Tickner should never forget that size and type respect all. Leg legibility for the eyes of our aged but young at heart reader, weakened by time, was also a top criterion. These remarks, I think, make clear more than any other in all of Jefferson's vast writings, and as you know, most of them are epistolary, thousands and thousands of them, and in all the scholarship that has been devoted to him, that he was not merely a collector of books. He was a reader. And he intended, with Tickner's help, and that of others, but so much with Tickner's help, to be a reader to the last. And it was in the following year, 1816, as far as I've been able to discover, that Tickner and Jefferson began their conversations about higher education in the United States and how to ensure its progress. Tickner opened the discussion in March of 1816. This was nearly a year after he had departed from Europe. He was in Europe seeking Jefferson's views on higher education in this country. I shall also feel it as a great favor if you will give me your opinion on the prospects of learning in the United States and the best means of promoting it, a subject which now occupies much of my attention. The subject much occupying his attention because of his prospective appointment at Harvard, as you've already heard, was already in the air. It would be but a few months later, on July 26, 1816, that Harvard's president, John Thornton Kirkland, wrote to Tickner to inform him that the corporation had voted approval of his appointment with the title Smith Professor of the French and Spanish Languages and Literature and of Belle Lettres. On Jefferson's side, he had worked for decades already on a comprehensive plan of public education, and this included higher education, viewing it as one of the essential means by which, and I'm quoting Jefferson, here, every fiber should be eradicated of ancient and feudal aristocracy and a foundation laid for a government truly republican. But the Virginia House of Delegates twice, in 1778 and in 1780, had flatly rejected his bill for the more general diffusion of knowledge, which he came to think more important than any, almost any other for the future of freedom and self-governance government. Tickner continued to press the issue of higher education with Jefferson when he wrote, I am exceedingly anxious to have this spirit of pursuing all literary studies philosophically and of making scholarship as little of drudgery and mechanism as possible transplanted to the United States in whose free and liberal soil I think it would at once find congenial nourishment. But after the July offer from Harvard, Tickner found himself in a dilemma. Seeking his advice, and you've already heard this, but uh, it, it bears repeating when we think of all young people and some older people's struggle to make the right decision. He wrote to his father, Alicia, it's now November of 1816, and he had three concerns. First, that the salary offered was insufficient. Should he marry, as he intended, although he had no candidate in mind at the time, <laughs> he would need to make up the income to the amount necessary to support a family. Second was the matter, as the young Tickner called it, of the Spanish part. <laughs> this was for him a new subject of study to which he had paid no attention since he'd been in Europe. He would need to spend another six months abroad at the intended in conclusion of his stay because six months would be the shortest time in which I could possibly get a suitable knowledge of Spanish literature. May I ask, Jose, how many months was it? Five and a half. Five and a half. Close, close. <laughs> he almost made his 
projection. Third, would the office and occupation of being a professor please his parents? And you've already heard this too. With his letter to Alicia Tickner, the young George placed an additional burden on his poor father's shoulders by including two draft letters, one accepting the Harvard Post, the other declining it. And he left it to his parents on whose financial support and approbation he depended Choose, dear father and mother, whichever you please, and be assured your choice will make me happy. <laughs> Dios mío. It was during this year of uncertainty that Tickner received from Jefferson Jefferson's own educational scheme for the state of Virginia, and this included his plans for the new university. Jefferson writes to Tickner, now it's June of 1817, this state, Virginia, proposes several such works. He's talking about waterways and navigation, but most particularly applied itself to establishments for education. By taking up the plan that I proposed to them 40 years ago, okay, it was actually 38, which you will see explained in the notes on Virginia. That's Jefferson's one and extremely important book. I won't tell you why, that's another story. Anyway, this included a single university embracing every science deemed useful in the present states of the world. This last may be very possibly be placed near Charlottesville, which you know is under view from Monticello. And here is that first private printing of notes of the state of Virginia, which Jefferson wrote in reply to, uh, and it wasn't directly to him, but he was the person assigned from the Virginia legislator to take it up to write about all of the aspects of these states and his assignment was Virginia. Uh, it says here, um, 1782, it's actually 1785, and you will note that because I'm telling you that this is the title page and Jefferson did not affix his name to it in the first editions at all, because it was, as it were, a kind of uh, catalog of information that might have been assembled, he said modestly, by anyone. Well, he didn't say that, but that was certainly what was in his mind. In any case, Jefferson was able to institute two very important and significant advances which are especially meaningful for all of us who are Hispanists and friends of Hispanism. In 1779, as an elected member of the Board of Visitors of the College of William and Mary and resident in Williamsburg as governor of Virginia at the time, Jefferson proposed curricular changes to substitute the modern languages for instruction in Latin and Greek, and that was accepted. Then second, in his foundation of the University of Virginia, in the report of the commissioners appointed to fix the site of the university, it was noted, and surely Jefferson is the author of these words, because we find these words in letters that he wrote to many of his young friends. The Spanish, he's referring to the language, among other modern languages, he says the Spanish is highly interesting to us as a language spoken by so great a portion of the inhabitants of our continents with whom we shall probably have great intercourse ere long. And is that also in which is written the greater part of the earlier history of America. After Jefferson sent his, uh, let's go back to that, oops, we don't know where we went. That, let's just stay on that because I think this is worth, we should all, we, we all know it, but we should all remember it. In any case, after Jefferson sent his prospective educational scheme for the University of Virginia to Tickner in June of 1817, it was five months later in November that Tickner dispatched from Rome his letter of acceptance of the Harvard appointment. His parents had obviously approved given that they would have to provide not only approbation but support. And it was just three weeks after that that Jefferson laid out for Tickner his plan for the University of Virginia in much greater detail. This would include elementary schools, we're talking about public education, elementary schools, 
collegiate institutions, which we might think of as bachilleratos or, or maybe as community college in this country, and a university. This last establishment will probably be within a mile of Charlottesville and four from Monticello if the system should be adopted at all by our legislature, which who meet within a week from this time. My hopes, however, are kept in check by the ordinary character of our state legislatures, the members of which do not generally possess information enough to perceive the important truths that knowledge is power, knowledge is safety, knowledge is happiness. Knowledge is power. And by the way, what is happiness to Jefferson? Happiness to Jefferson was to be purposefully mm, engaged in something that was important in life. It wasn't anything less. Knowledge is power. I bet you didn't know that we owe this utterance or at least a version of it to Thomas Jefferson. So here we have another logo for the Library of Congress t-shirt and baseball hat collection. <laughs> but most of all, we see Jefferson's hard-earned understanding of the slowness and the forward and backward movement of the workings of the democratic process which in this country he helped to create. Still in Europe, on August 10th, 1818, Tickner wrote to Jefferson as he turned his thoughts to home, reviewing his objectives and wondering about future prospects. Implicitly, the, impart, uh, the Harvard appointment he had already accepted nearly a year earlier. But what begins to emerge here is Tickner's uncertainty about the position that he has accepted. It's still a year before he's going home, and his reliance on Jefferson for advice about the kind of institutional arrangements that should prevail in the academy. Tickner wrote to Jefferson, and this is August of 1818, I propose to myself to acquire a good knowledge of all the literatures of ancient and modern Europe. My object in all has been to get general philosophical notions on the genius and history of each of these literatures and to send home good collections of books relating to the history of their languages and representing the whole series of their elegant literatures. All this time thus spent in Europe, I consider a sacrifice of the present to the future. And what I most desire is to make the sacrifice useful to my country. And now the question is, what I shall do with the knowledge that has cost me, let's not overdramatize some of the best years of my life. For political distinction, he goes on, I have no ambition, no thought even and never have had. If there was a department in the general government, that's the federal government, that was devoted to public instruction, I might seek a place in it, but there is none even in my own state government. All that remains for me, therefore, seems to be to go home and exert what influence I may be able to acquire in favor of the cause of good letters, and perhaps if a proper occasion offers, which is probable, give some years to instruction by courses or public lectures in our university. That occasion, as we know, had appeared. And Jefferson continues and closes his letters, his, this letter as follows. You see, sir, that I have spoken to you with great freedom, perhaps with too much. But the reason is that I desire extremely to have you know my situation as exactly exactly as it is, and here I would read my doubts exactly as they are, and to ask your advice and opinion on the course of life best for me to pursue when I reach my home and begin the world, as it were, for a second time at the age of 27, with a moderate fortune which makes me independent because my wants are few. Remember me, I beg of you, to Colonel Randolph and Mrs. Randolph, that's Jefferson's daughter and son-in-law, with their family, whom I hope to see at Monticello, if you will permit me to pay you a visit there soon after my return home. Farewell, my dear sir. And in the idiom of the country, that should be country, where I am, and he was in Spain, I pray heaven to preserve you many years, since all your years are years of usefulness. Almost as a postscript, he hastens to add, I had almost forgotten to say how much I am interested in the noble plan you have formed for education in your native state. I trust and believe it will succeed and already foresee the pleasure of witnessing your happiness in its success. 
Two months later, now it's October of 1818, Jefferson replies, with stronger wishes than expectations, he says, and he offers Tickner a professorship at the prospective institution liberally endowed under the name of the University of Virginia. He also points out that the object in which Tickner did express interest, a department in the general government devoted to public instruction, does not exist and cannot be until an amendment of the Constitution. And for that, and the necessary laws and measures of execution, long years must pass away. But he adds hopefully, in the meanwhile, we consider the institution of our university as supplying its place and perhaps superseding its necessity. Tickner necessarily, of course, turns down Jefferson's offer of a professorship. And now we're already in February of 1819. He cites the need to take care of his aged father at home in Boston. And of course, now he says it plainly, his commitment to offer lectures at Harvard. However, he offers his services to contribute in any way that he can to the progress and success of Mr. Jefferson's establishment, the existence of which he believes will have a salutary effect on our College of the North by responding to its indolence with a powerful and dangerous rivalship to emulate. Tickner arrives home in June, and on August 10, 1819, he takes up his duties at Harvard, offering the required inaugural address. Undaunted by Tickner's refusal of his offer, as he said, more wishful than hopeful, and now seeing young Tickner as an academic person at a kindred institution, he writes reassuringly, to Tickner on Christmas Eve of 1819, when Tickner has been at work for four months here at Harvard. Jefferson to Tickner. The liberality with which you view our kindred institutions is what I expected of you. It could not be imagined that the single University of Cambridge and that so near the northeastern corner of our union could suffice for a country so extensive as ours. And of course, after Jefferson's Louisiana purchase, it was a lot more extensive and had been much earlier. We are therefore not rivals, but rather fellow laborers in the same field where the harvest is great and the laborers few. Fellow laborers in the same field where the harvest is great and the laborers few. Here they emerge fully as colleagues, no longer mentor and mentee. Over the course of the next few years, Tickner shares with Jefferson, and we've seen it, his syllabus on Spanish literature. And a month later, that will be July of 1823, Jefferson sends Tickner a ground plan of the University of Virginia. Now regarding the character of the curriculum at the newly about to open, not quite, institution, Jefferson informed Tickner that the University of Virginia's curriculum with respect to that of Harvard would necessarily vary. That is, the holding at Harvard, the students all to one prescribed course of reading and disallowing exclusive application to those branches only which are to qualify them for the particular vocations to which they are destined. We shall, on the contrary, allow them uncontrolled choice in the lectures they shall choose to attend and require elementary qualifications only and sufficient age. We may lessen the difficulty perhaps of avoiding, by avoiding too much government, by requiring no useless observances, none which shall merely multiply occasions for dissatisfaction, disobedience, and revolt by referring to the more discreet of themselves, the minor discipline, the graver to the civil magistrates as in Edinburgh. On this head, I am anxious for information of the practices of other places, having myself little experience of the government of youth. <laughs> Jefferson asked Tickner to send him Harvard's program of academic regulations, but in a letter a little later, Tickner refrained from doing so, suggesting instead to send his own outline 
of a general plan for academic reforms on which he had been working against bitter opposition since the summer of 1821. And we're in 1823 now, so we've been working on it for two years. But these were Tickner's plans. It included a revision of the academic regulations and their administration, and as Jose has already mentioned, the organization of academic departments, more freedom in the choice of courses, studies, especially for students not wishing a degree, the separation of students into divisions according to their proficiency, improvement in the quality of instruction, and a general expansion of the scope and function of the institution. In harmony with Tickner's thinking, several months later, Jefferson, it's now 1824, writes, I'm sorry to hear of the schism within the walls of Harvard, yet I do not wonder at it. You have a good deal among you of ecclesiastical leaven. <laughs> the spirit of that order is to fear and oppose all change, stigmatizing it under the name of innovation, and that without innovation, we yet should still have been inhabitants of the forest, brutes <laughs> among brutes. Patience, pressure, as unremitting as gravity itself, can alone urge man on to the happiness of which he is capable. If uninitiated in the experience of the government of youth, Jefferson's decades of public life certainly served him well in recognizing the ecclesiastical level, leaven that colored the outlook of generations of his peers and successors. But he also knew that the problem was not New England Puritans because he'd seen it in Virginia and in all our state legislatures, as he said, the members of which do not generally possess information enough to perceive the important truths that knowledge is power, safety, happiness. The battleground that Jefferson and Tickner shared as comrades and equals at the end of Jefferson's life and in the maturity of Tickner's was, in short, that of education. Nearly a half century apart in age, they had common cause in pursuing values of education in the firm belief that learning was a necessary condition for liberty. In December of 1824, Tickner makes his second and final trip to Monticello. Recall that his first had been nine years earlier, also in the winter, February 1815. Now he goes with his wife, Anna, whom you have heard introduced, and they went from Boston to Washington, from whence they were accompanied by Daniel Webster to spend two days with James Madison at Montpelier and five days with Jefferson at Monticello. At this point in time, Tickner had been five years on the faculty at Harvard, while Jefferson had been fully engrossed in the preparations for the opening of the University of Virginia, one of the three life achievements by which he wanted to be remembered. You know this as his tombstone. He said, please don't make it of expensive material. Make it cheap so that nobody will be tempted to demolish or rob it. <laughs> but you can see here, what he considered to be the achievements of his life's work. The Declaration of Independence, which I will tell you later has an important correction by Benjamin Franklin in its prose, the authorship of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom, which caused no limit of controversy, and then his role, and he uses the term father of the University of Virginia. Tickner, though we're not there yet, that is, Tickner describes the present state of the University of Virginia's physical plant in a letter to his very dear friend, William Hickling Prescott, and this is during that visit. They have, he says, to begin it, a mass of buildings more beautiful than anything architectural in New England and more appropriate to a university than can be found, perhaps, in the world. But of the details of the curricular system, I shall discourse much when I see you. It is more practical than I feared, but not so practical that I feel satisfied of its success. It is, as we often say in the academy today, an experiment worth trying, to which I earnestly desire the happiest results. 
Let's see, and I'm wrapping it up very soon, how Tickner finds the now octogenarian. It's a decade after their initial meeting, as he describes Jefferson to Prescott. I find this to be a very touching portrait. Mr. Jefferson is entirely absorbed in it, that is the business of the university, and its success would make a beau final indeed to his life. He is now 82 years old, very little altered from what he was 10 years ago, very active, lively and happy, riding, riding horseback from 10 to 15 miles every day, and talking with the least restraint, very pleasantly upon all subjects. In politics, his interest seems nearly gone. He takes no newspaper but the Richmond Inquirer, and he reads that reluctantly. But on all matters of literature, philosophy, and general interest, he is prompt and even eager. He reads much Greek and Saxon. I saw his Greek lexicon printed in 1817. It is much worn with use and contained many curious notes. Mr. Jefferson seems to enjoy life highly and very rationally. But he said well of himself the other evening, when I can neither read nor ride, I shall desire very much to make my bow. When I can neither read nor ride, I shall desire very much to make my bow. This remark must have shaken Tickner, which I think is why he refuses to entertainment, entertain it, because he continues, I think he bids fair to enjoy both yet nine or ten years. He had seen Jefferson as a mentor, but now no longer on matters of guidance about his own professional future. He shares with Jefferson the concern for progress in higher education, each laboring in the field of his respective institution, one in Cambridge, the other in Charlottesville. Tickner and Jefferson's last exchange seems to have occurred on May 10th, 1825, with a letter from Tickner to Jefferson, and it is on the topic of the liberal academic programs they both sought to establish. I received duly your favor of April 12th with a copy of the exactments for your new university. It is a matter of great congratulation that you begin your establishment under such favorable auspices, and we can only hope that all things will succeed according to your present prospects. I shall be very anxious for further and constant information and very grateful for any it may be in your power to afford me. In return, I hope I shall soon be able to send you good accounts of beneficial changes and arrangements at our college in Cambridge. But Tickner received only persistent opposition from the still provincial Harvard faculty. I haven't shown them here, I thought we'd just stick with architecture. And in 1827, a year after Jefferson's death, those ideas were modified and practically abandoned, as Jose has pointed out, except in Tickner's own academic department. Tickner's two great losses, the death of a friend and fellow laborer, and the failure to secure broad educational reform at Harvard. Finally, when somewhat gratified with the success of his own pedagogical work, Tickner, nevertheless discouraged with his attempts to reform programs at Harvard and to make it a more effectual educational institution, he resigned his professorship in May of 1835. A full century after Tickner resigned his Harvard post, and a decade after his death, which occurred in 1871, Harvard's president, Charles William Eliot, who is remembered for transforming the provincial New England University into a preeminent research institution, he was, after all, president of Harvard for 40 years, paid tribute to Tickner in his report for the academic year 1883-84, where he cited Tickner as an academic reformer who was 50 years ahead of his time. The reform of the curriculum and the introduction of course choice had been the defeated reform that Tickner had so assiduously sought during his years on the Harvard faculty. 
from Tickner's doubts about taking the Harvard position, his battles for the reform of its curriculum, and his devotion to the cause of higher education and its, his, its benefit to the country, Tickner looked to Jefferson for advice and the affirmation of their shared convictions. In turn, Jefferson looked to Tickner for help in expanding his own library as Tickner created his own, and for inspiration in assembling an enlightened university faculty with Tickner as its model, if not as its recruit. It was indeed a meeting of minds, and it was sustained. When young, Tickner characterized Jefferson as being notable, as I mentioned, for his love of old books and young society. The same could be said of Tickner as he labored and lived nearly to the age that Jefferson had been on his passing. In the great hall of the Jefferson Building of the Library of Congress, the Roman goddess Minerva, guardian of civilization, pays tribute to Jefferson and his successors, among whom, you'll find this a little kitsch, as Jefferson would have George Tickner. But I want you to look again at Minerva. She appears here as the goddess of peace. She holds a two-headed spear, you can't see the top end, showing that she never relaxes her vigilance, and you can see that her shield and her war helmet are still close at hand, though on the ground, that she never relaxes her vigilance against the enemies of liberty and learning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, both of you. You have fascinating talks which really complemented each other so neatly, so nicely. I think it's been a real honor. I, and again, I feel really fortunate to have had this tribute to Tikna held here. And also, considering, considering that I'm surrounded by all of you who have followed Tickner's uh, footsteps in this very prestigious university. We just have, it's a bit too late, to, so I think we have time for just a couple of questions. Would anybody like to ask a question, either in English or Spanish? that he, gave, he offered to Harvard and they turned them down and they went to the Boston Public Library. Do you know? Do you I think that, that Jose will answer that question. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Jose. No, no. What I, uh, I think, well, his um, collection of uh, Spanish and Portuguese books went to the Boston Public Library. And that's something that he did in the mid-1850s because he wanted to uh, increase the collection of the Boston Public Library. He was uh, among the small group of uh, Bostonians uh, who, who made it possible because, uh, and he was following his father's uh, path in that. And, uh, his father believed in, published, uh, in, in public education. He was a, a teacher before becoming a merchant. So if I am not uh, mistaken, the Portuguese, and uh, mostly Spanish and Portuguese books went to Boston Public Library, and then the rest and the rest went to Commonwealth, I think. Yeah, I know. But I don't know exactly. I think we mentioned that before that uh, Harvard turned it down. I'm not completely sure. I've read that someplace yeah. recently. Yeah. And then all the materials, the manuscripts, and many of the material that uh, went to Dartmouth came um, after he, uh, his daughter died. Uh, the, because uh, Anna Elliot, the wife wanted to maintain the library uh, in whole in the house uh, in the, at the corner of Economic Park. So only when the house was demolished in 1902, the heirs, I think that Anna, Anna Tigner had already passed, and they decided to maintain the collection. And then he went to the Dexler family, and the Dexler family uh, and donate uh, to, to Dartmouth. So it's, uh, the, the Boston Public Library um, 
has the, the Spanish and Portuguese collection, and Tignor donated it with the proviso that it could uh, it had to be uh, of public access. And if the Boston Public Library uh, failed to do so, it would go to Harvard. So I think that, but I believe that there is a whole legality issue around that very interesting about how a collection stays together. And well, in the visit we uh, two weeks ago, we went to Whitener, and that, that was the condition of Whitener's mother that the library has to, mm -hmm. to be kept as a whole. The same thing happened with the Hispanic Society of America in New York City. Huntington wanted to maintain that labor of love, the labor of a whole life as a whole, uh, as, as a monument to the culture and the language and the, 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 the as we know. But the details, I think it would be worth exploring. Any more? Yeah. It might have been in Wikipedia or something. Yeah, like well, we, we all rely on that. that. I know, it said that um, Harvard famously turned down the I, I, um, I may have missed something, a lot of information going by. What do, you, do we know when and where Spanish was first uh, included in university curricula um, in, in Europe or in the United States? Hmm. Well, I don't know exactly. I think that um, at Harvard, which was the, the pioneering institution, uh, was probably um, in the mid 1810s. And Harvard had this, the, the, this famous instructor, Francis Sales, which was a, a French uh, from the from the Midi escaping the French Revolution, he went. Francis Sales went to Cadiz. And then from Cadiz, he came here. So French was m much more popular, but he did a private instruction in Spanish mm -hmm. to students who wanted to learn Spanish. And then, uh, as some of you probably know, when the, uh, the, the colonial wars and the, they, they realized that there will be new nations in the, in the south, uh, in, the, in, the, in the south part of the continent, and uh, then uh, the, the uh, Smith and other merchants started realizing the importance, and then the learning of Spanish became more prevalent. But it was always under the, uh, it was a second language. For example, the number of, of students taking French in the 1920s was approximately 100 and f 120, and only 30 w yeah. were taking Spanish. Right. So, and as Luis Fernandez y Fuentes in that study and other uh, scholars yeah. before that, it changed, the whole thing changed in the, uh, during the First World War when German fell from grace and then Spanish substituted. But the exact time, I am I'm uncertain, but I think it would be during the, the wars uh, of independence of the new republics in the, the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, this is where Jefferson was very important because uh, at the, uh, the 1779 uh, at the College of William and Mary and he, that he did substitute for Latin and Greek the modern languages and he really promoted the importance of the Spanish language not only in the foundation of the university but decades before that there were other young men whom he was mentoring as we would say now um, going to Europe or following their studies and there are three or four or five different varieties where he says you're in Italy go to Spain that's going to be useful to you and probably more useful to you than anything to learn the Spanish language. And there are variants of this. He had it very clear, and not as an academic, but as a statesman, because that was the very, very important thing for him. I didn't talk about his collection in his own library of the Spanish books, but I've been able to figure out what his interests really were along those lines, as I suggested. They're in the history and also in the natural history of the Americas. So he had that hemispheric um, actual outlook very early. But I have to tell you about his sale of the library, of his library to Congress, because they didn't want to buy it. 
I mean, who needed all those books in French? Nobody could read French, right? And besides that, there were those wild things that were absolutely not religious. And Jefferson had anticipated it. So before he sent his books away, even when he suggested maybe you could buy my library, because yours is decimated there in Congress now, he said, there is no subject on which a member of Congress may not have occasion to refer. <laughs> and he, music was one of his great loves, and even books on cookery and, and, and so forth. But he understood, well, you heard what he said about the legislature there. So there were, uh, I would say that in his case, it was a, um, uh, yes, it was for education, but it came from his own career and, and, and statesmanship, and it, it was geopolitical consideration, I guess we would say yeah. now. So Very so practical. Was there no fiction in his collection? Yes. Cervantes? Yes. Yes. I, <laughs> yes. Some, some time ago, I used to know when the professional associations were formed in the United States. Mm -hmm. And that's at the beginning of the 20th century. And that's when the American Historical Association uh, was created and a medical association. And, and I saw at one point a meeting of Spanish uh, professors uh, somewhere, I think it was uh, in, in, in the 1920s. Not before, but the American Association of Spanish and Portuguese uh, teachers was created. In teachers. Twenty uh, uh, nineteen, and uh, Federico okay. Leonis was very important in the in the creation of that association. It was first actually it was first Spanish, and then it opens up to Portuguese, mm -hmm. and that that uh, uh, that association expanded tremendously in two three years in yeah. nineteen in nineteen seventeen. And then in the 1920s, it became the, probably the, 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 the more uh, important association in the, in, of any uh, foreign language. And just to uh, go back to the other question, just to give you an example of what was the state of learning uh, foreign languages at the beginning of the 19th century, when Tignor wanted to learn German, he had to uh, learn a German grammar for his friend Edward Everett, but there was no uh, dictionary in Boston of German. So they have to send for a dictionary uh, uh, in Manchester, New Hampshire. They said, well, there is a dictionary there, and then they have to bring the book. So there were no books to study, and that was the project of his life, was to create a library. And he was fortunate enough to be able to, f first, to, to have a father who allowed him to do so, mm -hmm. have the money, the means, and then have the institutional support and for that reason, he was so eager to maintain his collection for the public use. So, and in that sense, he was, a, although he was a very elitist and an aristocrat of spirit, he was very de democratic in his approach to uh, public education. Thank you very much. Well, I think this is a good time to stop. Before we finish, um, I'd like to pay tribute to another Hispanist, a very important Hispanist of, of modern times, who died only last Sunday, Gabriel Jackson. And uh, so I think since we're paying tribute to Tick Knapp, who was probably the father of Hispanism here, I think we should also remember him because his, his work on Spanish modern history, particularly on, on, on the Civil War and the Second Republic, uh, uh, was very, very, very important, and not not only here but in, in in Spain. So I think we could remember him to finish this, this this event. Thank you very much again, Professor Adorno, and Professor Delfino. It's been a pleasure.